Hello, welcome to lesson 21 of the Practical OSPF series. In this lesson, we conclude our three-part mini-series on OSPF authentication by discussing key rotations and keychains. The last couple lessons in this series all had to do with OSPF authentication. Back in lesson 19, we discussed simple password-based authentication. We showed you the commands you would use to configure and verify simple password authentication, and we showed you how it isn't the most secure option you can use insofar as authentication. A much better option would be to use what is known as hash-based authentication, which was the focus of lesson 20. And in that lesson, we showed you how to configure and verify hash-based authentication. If any of that is unfamiliar to you, I'd recommend backing up and checking out the last two lessons in the series. In this lesson, we're going to be focusing on the last couple items I left you with in the prior lesson. And that had to do with these two items in this command to configure hash-based authentication. The first item is the key ID, which we told you is there to facilitate what's known as key rotation. Key rotation is how we answer this question. How do we change the keys on two routers that have an active neighbor adjacency without risking bringing the adjacency down? The second item we're going to discuss is this item right here, MD5. MD5 is a hashing algorithm that's been known to be somewhat less than secure since 2011 or so. A much more secure option is to use HMAC and SHA, which requires a new type of construct known as a keychain. In this lesson, we're going to be unpacking key rotations and then keychains, and then finally, we'll combine the two by showing you how to do a key rotation with keychains. So those are the three major items we want to discuss in this lesson. With that said, let's get into the first major item that we're going to discuss in this lesson. So again, here's the command we would use to configure a password on an interface for hash-based authentication. The command is ipospf, message digest, and then you specify a key ID, and then the algorithm and the actual password. Well, since the key ID is a part of the command, you can actually just configure multiple keys using different IDs. For instance, here, I've configured two different keys, one with key ID one and one with key ID two, each with a different password. Once I've configured multiple keys on a single interface, the router will accept a neighbor adjacency with anybody that presents either key. Moreover, the router is going to send out packets cryptographically hashed with both keys so that if the other side has one or the other key, a neighbor adjacency will still form. Then, once you've verified that a neighbor adjacency is using the newer key, you can go and delete the old key from your configuration. That's the basic premise for how key rotation works with OSPF authentication. With that out of the way, let's go ahead and jump on GNS3 and actually demonstrate this for you. You'll see that it actually does something interesting on the wire when you have multiple keys configured on the same interface. For this lesson, we're going to continue to use the same GNS3 topology that we've been using for the last couple lessons. Where we left off was router 2 had simple password-based authentication on Ethernet 00, that's facing router 1, and we do have an active neighbor adjacency there. And router 2 had hash-based authentication configured on Ethernet 10, and we do have a neighbor adjacency with router 3. From router 3's perspective, we only have hash-based authentication configured on the only interface that router 3 is using, Ethernet 10. The only difference is router 3 has it enabled across the entire area for all interfaces in area 0, but we do still have the neighbor adjacency between router 2 and router 3. At the moment, router 4 does not actually have any authentication configured. It just has an interface and a simplistic OSPF setup already applied. So that's our starting point for this demonstration. And again, if anything configured on your screen right now is unfamiliar to you, I'll check out the last two lessons in the series. Just like in the prior lessons, we want to actually show you what's happening on the wire as we're going through these configurations. So I'm going to go ahead and start a packet capture on the wire from router 2 to this hub. And again, the reason we're using a hub there is to make it easier to capture what is being sent by both router 2, router 3, and router 4. Once this loads, I'm going to limit the filter to just OSPF packets, and we'll show you what we're starting with so far. At the moment, router 2 is doing hash-based authentication, and we can verify that by seeing cryptographic in the auth type. Router 3 is also doing the same. There's cryptographic hash auth type. And finally, router 4 is just doing null authentication, which means no authentication at all. That's our starting point for this demonstration. The first thing I want to show you is the problem of key rotation and why we need it. And I'm going to show it to you by changing the key that we're using for Ethernet 1.0 on router 2, so it no longer matches the key that we're using on router 3. So I'm going to jump onto router. In fact, I'm going to do that in the opposite direction. I'm going to start on router 3. So I'm going to jump onto router 3, Ethernet 1.0, and I'm going to go ahead and know out the current key we are using. And then I'm going to change the key to something else. For simplicity, I'll just use 5.5. Now, at this point, if I look at the dead timer remaining on the neighbor adjacency between router 3 and router 4, we'll see something interesting. 
Notice the dead timer is now showing 26. We are using the default dead timers on this broadcast link, which is 10 seconds and 40 seconds, which means if in those 40 seconds or 26 seconds left, I don't configure the same key on router two, the neighbor JCC is going to go down. You'll see that shortly in about three seconds. This is why we need key rotation. If I get the key on the other side in time, great, we have no problems. But if there's a risk that I don't and the neighbor JCC go down, that means that router three is going to forget all of the routes learned from router two. And that could create some instability on your network. So key rotation is here to solve this particular problem. So let me show you how to use key rotation to solve this problem. First, I'm going to reconfigure the older key on router three to bring the neighbor JCC back up. I'll jump back into Ethernet 1.0. I'll do no IP OSPF message digest key ID of five. And then I'll reconfigure the exact same key of just five this time. And now that the keys match on both sides, we should see the neighbor JCC come back up the next time the hello packet is sent. There it goes. Okay, so now let me actually show you how to do key rotation. And again, it's really as simple as configuring multiple keys on the same interface. Now before I do that, let me show you some show commands to show you where we're starting from. I showed you this command, show IP OSPF int Ethernet 1.0 in the last few lessons. And I showed you this is what you would use to verify that hash-based authentication is being done on Ethernet 1.0 of router 2. If I configure a new key on router 2, you're going to see this output change. So let's jump onto Ethernet 1.0 and configure a new key. So I'll use IP OSPF. That says digest key. This time I'm going to use a key ID of 6. We'll still use MD5 and I'm going to use a key of 6. Once I hit enter, if I do the exact same command I did before, show IP OSPF int, you'll now see something different. Now, router2 is telling me we are still doing hash-based authentication, but the current youngest key is 6, and there is a key out there that's using, rather, there is a router out there that's using one of the older keys. That would be router3. On router3's perspective, if I do a show IP OSPF int, all we see is what we had originally, was that a single key is being used, key ID of five, since at the moment we still only have one key on router three. Whereas on router two, we currently have two keys being used, key five and key six. But the neat thing is I can let this run indefinitely and both keys will be used and router two and router three's neighbor adjacency will still be up since they have one matching keys. I can then in due time, go and update router three with the new key, key six, and the neighbor JSON C will never actually go down. If I jump onto router three, I'm now going to configure the new key, IP OSPF message digest six, MD5, six. Once I do this, you're going to see the output over here change. Notice how it was telling me over here, router two was saying that there is a router out there using an older key. Once the new key is applied to that older router, you're going to see this output change to confirm essentially that key rotation has completed. So I'm going to come down over here and do a show IP OSBF int Ethernet 1.0. And now notice it's just telling me we are doing key, rather cryptographic authentication with the youngest key ID of six, meaning the most recently configured key was key ID of six. Before, it was giving me this output indicating we are in the middle of a rollover. Now we're no longer doing that since both routers are confirmed to be using key six. And we can do the same show SPF int over here to confirm that we are using key six on both routers. When you see this in the output to show IP int, this confirms that you can remove any key that is not six safely. So now I can jump onto router three and I can remove any key that's not six, which at the moment would be key five. And I know there's no risk to the neighbor adjacency. And just for kicks, we can even look at the dead timer countdown, show IP OSPF neighbor. Notice currently it's 33. The hello timer is 10 seconds. So every 10 seconds, a new hello timer is going out, which refresh the neighbor adjacency. And this is why you see this dead timer go back up. This tells you that what was sent from router two did indeed refresh the neighbor adjacency with router two and router three. So again, when you see this, this tells you the key rotation has been completed and you're safe to remove any key that isn't key six. So for router two, we can go ahead and also remove 
D5, which we no longer need since the key rotation is now complete. Now, leaving multiple keys configured on an interface isn't also a good idea to do for a long period of time. We just showed you how you can use this to rotate to a new key, but once you've done that, you do want to remove the old keys when possible. Let me actually show you what's happening on the wire. And in fact, some of you might have actually seen it in this Wireshark packet capture over here while we we're going through our example. So first, let's go over to the wire and show you something. Notice on the wire, we have a hello packet sent from router two, then a hello packet sent from router three, and then a hello packet sent from router four. And you'll see it cycle through two, three, and four over and over again, since all the routers in this demonstration are using the hello interval timer of 10 seconds. But watch what happens when I configure multiple passwords on the interface for router two. I'm gonna go into ethernet one zero, I'm going to configure a couple more passwords. IP OSPF message digest, 3, MD5, actually let's do this, 7, MD5, 7, and IP OSPF message digest, 3, MD5, 3. So I configure two new keys on Ethernet 1.0, and all of them are in the running configuration. If I do a show IP OSPF int Ethernet 1.0, we should see that it's telling us we're in the middle of a rollover. There is a router out there using one of the older keys. Notice it doesn't tell you which of the older keys is being used, but you and I know from the configuration that it's this one. But the most recent key, rather, and the most recent key is key ID 3. Notice if we go over to the wire, something interesting is happening. I currently have three keys configured on router 2. Notice router 2 sent three hello packets in a row. Let me actually make this a little bit bigger to make this easier to see. Three hello packets sent in a row. And if we wait another 10 seconds, you'll see again, one hello packet from router four, one from router three, and then three new ones from router two. What's happening is router two has to duplicate every OSPF packet it sends for every single OSPF key that is configured at that interface. If we look inside the hello packet, we can see that one of these, let's make this a little bit bigger, we can see that one of these OSPF hellos is using a key ID of six, the other one is using a key ID of seven, and the last one, as expected, is using key ID of three, matching the three keys that I've configured on this particular router. So you don't want to leave key rotation enabled indefinitely because you're duplicating the packets that are sent by router two for every single key that you have configured. At the moment, router two is doing three times the work since I have three keys configured on router two. Now, during an actual key rotation, that is an acceptable loss because we want the key rotation to avoid the risk of the neighbor JCC going down, but long-term, that isn't something you wanna leave indefinitely. So that takes care of showing you key rotation with OSPF. Let's go back to the slides to talk about the next item on our agenda for this lesson. So that takes care of showing you how to do key rotation using this way of configuring hash-based authentication with OSPF. The next thing we wanna focus on is this hashing algorithm choice that we used. MD5. As I mentioned before, MD5 has been considered less than secure since 2011. A much better option is to use a SHA within an HMAC. Now, there's two things going on there, so let's talk about each of them. SHA is just another hashing algorithm, just like MD5, but a little bit more modern. SHA is actually a family of hashing algorithms that supports multiple digest lengths. Recall that the digest is simply the result of running something through a hashing algorithm. With SHA, you can have SHA-1, which does a 160-bit digest, or SHA-256, 384, and 512, which do 256, 384, and 512 digest lengths, respectively. What about this HMAC? What is an HMAC? Well, without getting too far into the cryptography of it, HMAC is simply a more secure way of combining a message, or in the case of OSPF, a packet with some sort of secret key, your authentication key that you configure on the interface. HMAC is simply doing it more securely than simply appending the authentication password to the end of the packet, which was what MD5 was doing within OSPF. Now, if you're interested in learning more about HMACs, I'll point you to this video. But insofar as OSPF authentication, this is probably sufficient to understand what's going on with HMAC and SHA. With that said, the only way to configure HMAC and SHA is to use a new configuration construct known as keychains, and that's what we're going to show you next. Keychains are simply another way of configuring multiple authentication keys. The contract essentially looks like this. 
you create a keychain and you give it a name. And within that keychain, you have multiple keys. Here we have key one with a password of password and key two with a password of secret PW. Keychains themselves are used by OSPF, but they're not purely an OSPF function. There are other places in Cisco IOS that also use keychains that don't have anything to do with OSPF. The commands to configure a keychain look like this. First, you use the command key space chain, and then you give the keychain a particular name. And then you can configure as many keys as you want using this configuration block right here. You type the command key, and then you give it a key ID. Then you specify what cryptographic algorithm you want to use. And finally, the actual key string over here. If you use an algorithm of MD5, it's actually backwards compatible with doing hash-based authentication with OSPF using this command, since this command is also using MD5. So that takes care of telling you the commands, but now let's actually show it to you. Let's jump over to GNS3, and again, I'll show you what's happening with keychains, how to configure it, and how to verify them. So here we are back in GNS3, and the only thing that's different from prior is that I removed the other keys we had configured on Ethernet 1.0 for router 2. Right now, router 2 and router 3 are both using a key of 6. And you can see that the adjacency between router 3 and router 2 is indeed up. But router 4 this whole time has been sitting there, lonely, looking to become neighbors with someone. But so far, we haven't actually configured any authentication on router 4. So that's where we're going to start with our configuration of keychains. Now I'm going to show you that keychains are indeed backwards compatible with doing this way of configuring passwords using hash-based authentication with OSBF. So let's jump on router 4 and configure our first keychain. Now to start, I'm going to show you the show commands that we're going to be using later on to verify keychains. This will show you the before version. So I'll do show IP OSPF. You'll notice that at the moment, area zero is doing no authentication. And I'll do show IP OSPF int, showing you that at the moment, Ethernet 1.0 is also not doing anything authentication because we're not seeing anything here at the end of this command. With that in mind, let's start by configuring a keychain. So I'll jump into global configuration. I'll use the command keychain. And for this example, we'll configure the name of the keychain as Pracnet. I'll hit enter, and then in here I can specify a key, and then here I can specify a key ID. This key ID is going to match the key ID I'm using over here with doing the old way of configuring hash-based authentication. So for this example, I'm going to use a key ID of six. And then in here, I can specify a few different options. The first option I'm going to specify is this guy, the cryptographic algorithm, and I'm going to match what we have over here, MD5. But notice I have other options as well. But for now, we'll just use MD5. And then the actual key string I'm going to use is where I configure my actual authentication password. And for now, we'll use a password of six, which is exactly what we have configured over here in router two. Once I hit enter, we can do show run to take a look at what we have configured. And you'll notice exactly what we have configured is exactly what we typed in a moment ago. Now, so far, nothing has actually happened. because so all we've done is configure a keychain. We haven't actually applied it anywhere. To apply the PRACnet keychain to an interface, I would use this command. Int Ethernet 1.0 to jump into the interface that's facing router 2 and router 3. And the command is going to be IP OSPF authentication keychain, and then the name of the keychain, in this case, PRACnet. Notice, once I hit enter, we'll see that the neighbor adjacency is going to go up. Remember that in the prior way of configuring hash-based authentication, we had to first configure a password and then enable hash-based authentication. Using keychains, however, this one command sort of does both. It applies the passwords that you have configured and turns on hash-based authentication using the keychain you specified. Notice router four is now finally joined the neighbor adjacency between router two and router three. Show IP OSP of neighbors. Router four is finally happy with friends on this link. Now let's show you those show commands that we showed you earlier. If I do show IP OSPF, you'll notice that it's still indicating we aren't doing any authentication in area zero. Because again, this will only change if we enable authentication for all interfaces within the routing process ID, which we haven't for router four. We can use the other command, show IP OSPF int, to show you that we are indeed doing cryptographic authentication, meaning hash based authentication. We're using a key ID of six from the keychain practice. But notice this keychain is totally compatible with doing hash based authentication the other way that we've been doing so far in this mini series.
So that is showing you the configuration of keychains. But remember the whole purpose of keychains was to use an algorithm that is more secure than MD5. We already know how to use MD5 using the old way of configuring hash-based authentication. So what we actually wanna show you is how to do SHA and HMAC with keychains. But before we do that, let's go ahead and start a packet capture on the wire on the link between router two, router three, and router four. So we can show you how what is sent on the wire changes when we're doing SHA and HMAC with OSPF. Again, I'll limit the display filter to just OSPF packets and we'll take a look. Now to start, if I jump on router two, you'll notice that looks just as we would expect any other OSPF header to look like, the way we've seen these to look like throughout this little mini series on OSPF authentication. If I jump to router four, you'll see it's essentially the same thing. We're doing cryptographic authentication with a data length of 16, meaning this digest is 16 bytes, which equates to 128 bits, which is the length of the digest that MD5 uses. You'll see this change once we change router four to use HMAC and SHA. Now where this change happens is within the keychain. So if I do show run section keychain, we'll see this is where I had set to use the MD5 algorithm. If I wanted to use a different algorithm, I'd have to go back into the keychain, back into key six, and change the cryptographic algorithm to one of these other algorithms. What I'm gonna be using for this example is HMAC SHA-1. SHA-1 creates a 160-bit digest, which equates to a 20-byte digest. Once I change this to HMAC SHA-1, we should see the most recent hello packet sent from router four will look different. This is what it looked like before sent from router four. But if we go to the most recent hello packet from router four, we'll see that now it's sending a 20 byte digest, which is as you would expect using SHA-1 for this particular packet. Now, obviously, if router four is using SHA-1 and router two and router three are using MD5 still, we're gonna see that the neighbor adjacency is about to go down. All we need is for the dead timer to expire. Oh, there it goes. You'll see right there as I was typing it, the neighbor JCC went down. So you do have to match the cryptographic algorithm on both sides of the wire, which makes sense because if you don't, the digest would never match, even if you're using the right password. So let's go ahead and go to router two and reconfigure the authentication to use HMAC and SHA. We're essentially gonna match the configuration we have on router four for the keychain. So in fact, I'm just gonna copy and paste it for simplicity. I'll take all of this, and copy and paste the configuration for the keychain. Now I will mention that the keychain name is only locally significant. It doesn't actually have to match. The key ID though does have to match. But now that we're using HMAC and SHA, I now need to apply the keychain pracnet to router two. If I do a show run int eth10, this is where I would do it. I'm gonna remove, rather, I'm going to change this command, IP OSBF authentication, to instead of doing message digest authentication to go straight into keychain. And I'll use the keychain of Pracnet. Once I've done that, we should see the adjacency between router two and router four come up, but the adjacency between router two and router three at some point will go down once the dead timer expires. Here we see router four adjacency has come up just as we expected. And if we go to the wire, we scroll down to the last packet sent by router two, this one happens to be an LS update, but you can see that the cryptographic block looks the same for all packets. In this case, we do have a 20 byte digest, meaning this is 160 bits, which is the result of SHA-1. So that takes care of showing you how to configure keychains on Cisco IS routers. Let's jump back to the slides to quickly show you how to do key rotation with keychains. So we just showed you how to configure keychain-based hash-based authentication with OSPF, and we proved that it is indeed backwards compatible with the older way of doing hash-based authentication so long as you use the MD5 algorithm within the keychain. But earlier in this lesson, we showed you how to use this key ID and this way of configuring hash-based authentication to do key rotation. Well, how does key rotation work when you're using keychains? It's a little bit different than how it worked over here. Let me show you. Keychains use a date-based key rotation mechanism. The way it works is each key allows you to specify a send lifetime and an accept lifetime. The send lifetime is how long a particular router is going to be sending packets cryptographically hashed with that particular key. And the accept lifetime is how long that particular key will be accepted for incoming packets sent via neighbors. 
both of these arguments can be added within each key block within each key. So this is what we showed you before, how you can specify a cryptographic algorithm and a key string within each key block. But you can also configure a send and accept lifetime within each key block as well. Now, the best way to understand date-based rotations with Keychain is to show you a configuration example. So here we have a configuration example of doing a different key for each quarter of the year. Notice I have a keychain called Rotation Demo, and I've got four keys configured within this keychain. The key string for each of these are quarter one, quarter two, quarter three, quarter four. You'll see why in a moment, and clearly that is not very secure, but it'll work for this example. And in all cases, our keys are using HMAC SHA-256. But where I want to point you to is the send lifetime and accept lifetime. And you'll notice I cut off the lifetime, the ME at the end of these, just to line up these fields to make it a little bit easier to understand. In all cases, we're using the local time zone of the router. And this first key is going to be sent from 2 a.m. January 1st, 2022, all the way through 3 a.m. April 1st, 2022. But this key will be accepted one hour before and one hour after. In the next quarter block, we're accepting, rather, we're sending this key from 2 a.m. April 1st to 3 a.m. July 1st. And again, we're accepting that key one hour before and one hour after. What we've done with this demonstration is configure a quarter-based key so that every new quarter, I'm using a new key. And the key rotation will happen automatically, and I'll accept the old key for one more hour, giving some overlap between the new key and the old key. That is the basic idea behind this demonstration of key rotation. But of course, I want to do more than just tell you about this demonstration. I want to show it to you. So let me copy and paste everything we have here and actually paste it into a live Cisco router. For this example, we're going to be using router one, but it doesn't really matter because we're not actually going to configure the alternating peer to have the same passwords. We're just going to show you date-based rotation on router one. I'll jump into global configuration and I'll simply copy and paste what I just had in my notepad a second ago. Now, if I do a show keychain, we can see that router one is telling me we have a keychain configured of rotation demo. We have four keys. And here are the date ranges configured for each of those keys, and you'll see that they match exactly what we typed in. But notice, because of the current time on router one, it's telling me we are currently in the fourth quarter. And that makes sense because I'm recording this on October 4th, which does indeed fall in the fourth quarter for this configuration. But just to show you how it actually works, let's modify the system clock for router one to show you how router one would step through each of these keys. So first, I'm going to change the clock to January 1st using the clock set command. I'll change it to one minute after 2 a.m., which is one minute after we are sending. Rather, we have configured to send that key. And I'll do this uh, January 1, 2022. Now, if I do show keychain, you'll see that currently, since we are one minute after the send lifetime over here, this is the send, rather, this is the valid send lifetime appropriation, and this is the accept lifetime for the current date and time. If we change the clock to go to 3.01 a.m., meaning one minute after of April 1st, meaning one minute after we are sending, rather, we are no longer sending this first key, you should see this valid now move down to the next location over here. So let's go ahead and do that next. I'm going to change the clock to April 1st and at 3.01 a.m. Now, if I do a show keychain, you'll see that at the moment, router one is currently sending this key, quarter two, but is willing to accept either this key or this key, since the current date that we have just set it to falls within the accept lifetime here and the accept lifetime here. So currently, I'm in that one hour overlap between a key rotation. So I'm in the middle of an actual key rotation if this was a real demonstration. Finally, the last thing I want to show you is going all the way into quarter two. So let's change the clock. I'll set it to 4 a.m., one minute after 4 a.m., April 1st, 2022, or rather, yeah, April 2nd, 2022. And we should see that this key is no longer valid because now we are outside of this particular range. If I do a show keychain, the only keys that are valid insofar as send lifetime except valid is quarter two because that's where we are. 
So that's the idea behind date-based rotation using keychains. Now, this way of doing key rotation using dates in the future and configuring a password to rotate to some point in the future is potentially a little bit more convoluted than necessary. I actually rather like the more simplistic way of doing key rotation using cryptographic hash-based authentication that we showed you a few moments ago. Consider the security implication of doing date-based rotation and using a key that is in the running configuration for months before it's actually in use. Often, you're not going to go through the trouble of doing this, but I did want to show it to you as an option in case it comes up in a certification exam or something. Most of the time, if you're doing key rotation in the modern world, you actually have the terminal for both routers open at the same time, and you simply copy and paste the key at the exact same time. And you do it within the maintenance window so that if a neighbor adjacency goes down and you lose some routes, that's at least expected and in an off busy time. Or you use automation to script out the changing of passwords on many different routers at the exact same time, all in a coordinated fashion, all likely also within a maintenance window. But I did want to at least show you the configuration of keychains and tie in the idea of key rotation that we had mentioned earlier in this lesson. And with that said, we actually wrap up everything we wanted to communicate to you in this lesson. The main takeaways from this lesson are one, understanding how to do key rotation using interface based keys and the key ID argument. Two, understanding how to configure keychains and more secure hashing algorithms like HMAC and SHA. And three, the date based key rotation mechanism that keychains uses. And with that said, we bring this lesson to a close. If you enjoyed this lesson, then don't forget to like and subscribe. And also let me know in the comments below what else you want to learn about regarding OSPF. Thank you for watching this video, and we'll see you in the next one.